Hey, Azure Vanity Podcast, great to have you guys here. Excellent to be we here. Are all it's been a long just... time in the making. Yes. Yes, we yes, quick. <laughs> this is, as we just we just came off stage from off stage, uh, and guy was talking about at one point that he's been in space for ten years. You're an old man here now. I am an old man. I'm ancient. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> he's Methuselah. Like when it comes to this field, he's got the wisdom. He's been around for a while and shit. Nice. Well, we are Edge of NFT, and what we like to do is talk about the things that are pushing the envelope in space. Things literally at the edge of the space. Uh, That's us. We were Gilroy's right there, man. It, it is, yeah. So we uh, had the pleasure of hearing you talk over at VCon uh, a few weeks so ago. Wonderful. Many impressive things about that talk. Probably the most is that you're standing there by yourself <laughs> on stage, man, holding the fort. I mean, holding it down. That is. That's else. always the way I would prefer it. At the end of the day, it's yeah. always I could always get everything across, um, but by myself. Like they, sometimes they put you with moderator. Like today we had a moderator. Yeah. Stuff, and the boys were wonderful. But generally speaking, I've been doing it for like three decades. So it's like. Just give me a mic, I'll get up there. I'll, I'll cover you. How long you need? Two hours? I got you. Got it covered. Fill that with content. Please. But um, the, the being at the edge, if you will, uh, is something that has always been interesting to me and a big part of, I hate using this word, but my brand. The thing that I've always done in my career is try to go where nobody else is. And not because I'm visionary, because I don't want to, fucking compete. I'm not good enough to compete, right? So why do I want to be in an established place when I could go be the big fish in a small pond? Mm -hmm. This is the way I've conducted my entire career, man. I, you know, like I made an independent film. Like I didn't try to go work in a studio system and stuff like that. Just try to find like your way in and stuff. And, and sometimes that way generally for me has always been on the fringes. It's always not in the mainstream. And then shortly after I get involved in the thing, it becomes mainstream and not because I did it. I just get there a few minutes before everyone else finds out about it. Podcasting, indie film, um, blogging. Um, I've been around so long, I, I did it all, man. And now like this, the idea of taking a feature film into the NFT space like I asked David Shapiro, I was a producer on a flick, I was like, has anybody done that? And I, I, we had this conversation like a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago at this point. And he was like, no. And I was like, what, could we? You know, he's a producer of the movie, so he had some say in the matter. And I was like, what if instead of like taking it out traditionally, we did this thing? Like, would that, I was like, I, I don't know enough about the space, would that be revolutionary? And he was like, absolutely. He's like, that's what everyone's wanting. Everyone's wanting, like right now, it's just a lot of single images and stuff and images that move. And there's a lot of creative work, but like a whole feature, that would be a step forward. Like like Guy said on stage, it's it's primitive. Like we're, we're, years from now, people will look back at Kilroy and be like, so silly. But it's the necessary step in order for everyone else to come into the space. Like if we do it and it works, every studio is gonna open up their library and just be like, all right, so it's DVD all over again. Cause now we could just sell you yet another copy of Terminator yeah. and you are gonna own this one right. for real. So that's what's coming. That's what the future looks like. And to be here now, early before everyone else gets there and I know they're coming as I said on stage and I, I said at VCon when we started talking about launching Kilroy as an auction like over a year ago I started hearing from people that I don't hear from anymore who were like this is very smart we're watching because not that they're interested in my career at all but they're just like if you can make fucking two nickels off of this then we're gonna we're gonna make way yeah. more than you and so they're waiting to see a guinea pig go first and me and God get to be the guinea pigs with Kilroy. And thankfully, like he had the vision to see that. I, my vision was like, oh, let's just sell it to one person and let them figure it out. Which is just a variation of what I do in independent film. Like, you know, you make it and then you hope somebody buys it. Guy's idea was like, no, don't do that. We make a community. That community then supports the movie and then that community then creates the sequel together. It's not so much we're making a product and we're gonna sell it and how many widgets did we sell. 
It's about building family and community with a bunch of people that are like, oh, I understand what you're doing. I think I can bring something to it too. One of my favorite fucking stories in the world is stone soup. The story I heard as a kid, and it really does apply to like our business. It's a starving fucking town, right? Nobody could eat and shit. There's not enough food to go around. And then this guy comes into town. And he's like, I got a magic stone. Uh, I can make stone soup, save the town and shit. We got a big pot. He's going, you bring, what do you got? He's got Eric here. He's like, you bring that. What do you got? And everybody had a thing. And he's like, all right, everybody bring it, put it in the pot. He's like, and now the stone, that'll make it. And he fucking dropped it in and everybody's like, holy shit, we're fed. It was all there. Yeah. It just took one person to be like, you come in here, you come in here. You go. That's what a director does, essentially. Just like, come over here, you stand here, do this, say this, blah, blah, blah. So the idea of like coming in and being and coalescing a community around a stone, the stone is Kilroy, but that community coalesces around fucking Kilroy and we continue to build that community. It's no different than what I've been doing for years with my own fan base. Thanks to Clerks and Mall Rats, there were people who were like, hey man, I'm interested in you and what you do. And so I started getting out on the internet in like 1995 with a website where I could talk to people. There's two filmmakers on the web at that point. It's me and Peter Jackson. And he got very successful. He eventually got off the internet and started making fucking Academy Award movies and shit. <laughs> I stayed on the internet. But we were the only two. And like I couldn't believe there were more because it's like you're, you're talking to the people who actually buy tickets. You know, prior to that, you'd read reviews and you'd see box office and that's how you knew how you did. But suddenly we were in this world where I could talk to the person who bought a fucking ticket to go see this dopey thing and be like, why? And you could create a relationship with that person beyond simple like uh, trading of commodity. Or, you know, like you bought a thing, goodbye, we're done. That relationship keeps going. Why? Because I'm gonna make another thing one day and I want that person to come back and shit, returning customers. So, so I'm curious, with Kilroy, do you see your historical community or fan base joining the party or a lot more new fans? What do the demographics look like if, if you could like predict what's gonna happen here? I see, what I've seen so far is a few cats who follow me traditionally are jumping into the space. I saw a guy who I was very surprised in my Twitter feed the other day who bought on the early drop. He's like, I have to figure out how to do it, but he's going, I got it. And that blew my mind because I didn't think that cat was gonna be one of those cats. But for some people, you, you capture their imagination where they're like, well, wait a second, what is this? Like, and, and it's new? All right, you know, and so suddenly a portion of them come over for you. But I would say largely it's the community itself. That's what it looks like. It's people already in the space who believe in, in the idea. They're like, oh my God, if this works for this cat, then the sky's the limit. So I've seen a lot more support from within um, the Web3 community, the crypto community, the NFT uh, community, only because people outside of it, they, they don't even know how to get a digital wallet going. You know what I'm saying? But that becomes part of the education process. Once the, uh, the NFT drops, then it's gonna be a lot easier to kind of educate the people who don't know shit. They don't have a fucking crypto portfolio. They don't know anything. You know, the coin base, what's that? So you could bring in, and I would imagine that's something that Guy and Secret would be interested in, like fucking new eyeballs and stuff like that. But how'd you guys actually connect, right? You have this idea. You're like, yeah, I want to do this thing. Like the actual act of changing that idea to reality is something special. No. How did y'all connect to make this what thing a happen? great question. Where that did that is, come that, from? That is a great question. So, um, uh, I got connected to I got connected to David, who's uh, Kevin's uh, co-producer, yeah. through some other person um, from Curio. Curio is another NFT company. Uh, they were working with David on I think several projects and several things, and uh, um, uh, Ben from Curio said, "Hey, you should meet David." We got together, we got excited, and David David is an amazing person. He has a lot of ideas, so I know. Uh, I, I know Kevin is uh, throwing the, the credit my way, but it was more of like a, a joint effort, sitting with um, with with David, with Kevin, with uh, Jordan, who's uh, uh, also um, Kevin. She runs our company. Yeah, 
And, and all together we just said, okay, like, the, you know, it's a great idea. It's an amazing concept. We think that our technology can do more than, you know, what others can do. But, you know, the concept of uh, just selling it as an auction to one person, that's not inclusive. That's not in the Web3 spirit. And so all together we just came up with this, I think, new great idea. And right. also, the, like, it shouldn't, there, there's a bit of sexy involved as well because they just, they were coming off of their Quentin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, NFT project. So it's, you know, like. We were there when that project got announced. That was pretty exciting in NFT New York. Yeah. But, but also, actually, like, the, some of the fallout and you know, some of the questions around intellectual property. So interesting. Created a great, like, conversation. Yeah. Like, aside from just, like, we all want to be entertained. We all want some shit to occupy our day. Yeah. So. Saying like, hey, Quentin Tarantino is gonna uh, sell one of his scripts as an NFT. That's story enough. But then all the stories that came on top of it, like where people are like, well, I don't know if he's allowed to do that because we own that property. And his point of like, no, you own the movie. Yeah, I own the script. It's like, freaking important. That's an important conversation. It's an important conversation, absolutely, to have that came out of NFTs. Yeah. Um, so those guys working with Quentin made them sexy enough for me to be like, I'm sorry. They were involved with the Quentin NFT, but I'm listening to this conversation. <laughs> nice. And it took me, I mean, you gotta think about it, like we were set on doing a thing one way. We were like, we're gonna auction it, and that's what we talked about and did a lot of press on it. But the fact that like they were coming up with an alternative idea wouldn't have penetrated if they hadn't also worked with Quentin. That's what got my attention, where I'm like, well, Jesus, fucking, I know Quentin. And he don't, he's not the guy that's like, uh, anything for a buck. You know what I'm saying? He makes enough money doing what he does. So he ain't like me spinning plates everywhere and shit like that. He concentrates on just filming. Right. The fact that he got involved in this, got engaged in a relationship with these cats and like did what he did with the, with the NFT. That to me was like, they must be special. Well, they definitely are. I mean, we've seen a lot of the stuff they've done and, and the capabilities there, especially getting involved at this stage. Right, the ground floor uh, with everything that you're doing, right? Because I'm sure you're setting the stage for all kinds of fun stuff that can be released later, yeah. right? In addition to the, the initial release, all the, you the know, notes like, that you've taken down on Kilroy and all that and, stuff. And right? with like, you know, if I was doing a DVD, you get one bite of the apple, right? Yeah. You put it all on that DVD and if you found other stuff later on, then you gotta release a whole ass different DVD. Yeah. The beauty of this is we can augment for time immemorial. Yep. How do you feel about the responsibilities that come with actively managing a community? It's it's more active, right, day to day, whereas, you know, fans of yours can can just, you know, press play and, and see your content and, right. and track you. This is we, we've talked a lot this week with folks about how, you know, web three, your stakeholder groups kind of converge together. Yeah. Right? This is not just a fan, these are investors. Yeah. Right? I, what, what's what's been your thinking on that sort of shift? I got like 20, 25 years experience in terms of community building. Um, because even though like, you know, um, a lot of people can just press play and shit like that. Then there's a whole cross section of people who are like, I'm on your website and I'm asking you a question. I'm coming to your live event, buying a ticket. I'm going to your store and doing a thing. So for better part of my career, the only reason my career has lasted this long is because I fostered a community from like 1995 onward that I can count on. Like that I'm not one of these people that's like, well, I hope the audience shows up for this movie I'm making. If I keep the budget right, I know this many people will show up for time and memorial until they start dropping fucking dead, which is happening now because we're all in our 50s and shit. So I've already built like community after community so that aspect of this, that's what was kind of one of the selling points. Like I said, it's like the spirit of Web3 is community. And so I've had so much experience doing that on the internet already for the last 20 years that it's a no brainer. It's easy, like it's built into You're my like, real bring it. Like, like It is, it's another really, day like when office. Twitter started, I was like insanely ready because I'd spent 15 years prior to that on my message board writing longer responses. And somebody is like, you only do 140 characters. I'm like, well shit, I can do that in my sleep. So I was just ready for it. 
Mm -hmm. Like it, it was a skill set I didn't know I had, and they built a thing that required that skill set. And I was like, "Holy shit, I'm ready!" Same kind of thing here. Community building aspect is something that like is already in me because I haven't had the luxury of like being a George Lucas or a J.J. Abrams where you do one thing and the whole world's like, "Fucking, you're canonized forever and stuff." I got to prove every time out that I'm worth their time or or effort, particularly as I age. You know, in the beginning, it was easy to catch people because you're like, you're new, you're fresh, you're edgy and shit. The longer you stick around, the harder it is to find something new to impress people who've been watching you for decades at this point. So building community allows me to not have to work insanely mainstream where I got to get everybody or else my job don't work. I just have to get this. And this space is this right now. Yeah, I mean, you look at Bored Apes, I mean, they've turned 10,000 collectors into a multi-billion dollar adventure. And they, and they're they having that. fun doing it. Yeah. Like, not just the people who made the shit, I'm sure they're having fun with the money and shit, but the people who are collecting, like... They're having a blast. A absolute fucking blast, and it built a Ape community. Fest, New York. Yes. Four days, But that's right? like, but honestly, like, looking at my own small microcosm version of that, like, when we started the Bioskew website, it built its own little self-sustaining community where I could have events and I could sell you know, as long as I'm, I'm only doing like, you know, a thousand people, we're going to be great. We're going to a thousand people are going to come from all over the place. So community is, is such a big fucking part of it, man. And that's part of the appeal of this whole world to me. It's not just like in my other worlds, like you make a thing, you put it out there and that's that. And I spent a lot of time tending to it because for me, the story don't fucking begin and end when the movie credits happens the, the, the story begins when I'm like hey we're gonna make a thing and it's not the whole world but a bunch of people that do pay attention is like well, what is that thing you're starting to talk about it then like a year before the movie exists and then when the movie's over if you're really good at your job it's not like credits and then the conversation's over you want to extend the life of that you want to keep it fucking going I've, I've always well. I've always like been annoyed by the amount of time between a sequel to a, a good thing and like I think with that time sometimes the energy of the project erodes and, and the characters shift and people move on in real life everything's evolutionary right, right. Yeah, there's definitely a balance there but you're, you're uniquely positioned man like a lot of people like Gary V for example similar in a lot of ways with how you engage in your community how far ahead of the curve you really were there are not a lot of people like you that were that engaged with their community that genuinely take that time to follow up to nurture it they are growth. now like I'll, I'll it's happening. yeah it's now you can't be in my business and not give a shit about that like I remember early on in my career you know, like people make fun of me for like, you spent a lot of time on the internet, man. I'm like, well, wait, wait, you might as well live in your parents' basement. And I'm like, bro, I made clerks. So we know I don't live in my parents' basement, number one. <laughs> number two, like, I'm a smart businessman. Like, I, I, I want to continue doing the business the way I want to do the business. So if I'm, if I'm not making Marvel shit, which makes a lot of people happy, and that's an easy sell, I'm making very selective shit. Like, and I'm not saying it's like, it's not for everybody because it's smart. It ain't for everybody because everybody's like, I like my shit normally better than your shit. So I'm working with like this many people as opposed to this many people. And it's always easier to work with this many people. It's always easier to satisfy this many people. This many people, man, they'll, they'll be varying opinions about like whether or not I've satisfied them artistically. Yeah. This many people, if I'm playing right to the right audience, I can make them happy every time. I learned that, like I've learned it for years, but in 2019, we took uh, Jay and Silent Bob reboot out on the road. We did a 65 city tour and we sold out every damn show. Every night I watched the movie with a thousand people who made me feel like we were at a church where I was both the priest and Jesus himself. Like you were the celebrant and you were being celebrated. I wouldn't get that if we just released the movie on 2000 screens. You know, I'd hear reports and I'd get box office figures, but I was there in the room for it, man. And that comes from community. Those fans are so fucking dialed in. They know every aspect of every flick I've ever made and whatnot. Being there with them to watch the movie live and shit and then Q and A, that, that became the model for the rest of my life. I won't go back the other way. Like now, 
that the whole reason Clerks 3 exists is because of that reboot tour. I was like, mm -hmm. that's what I want over and over and over again. Building a community is is has been the only thing that has kept me alive. There are other filmmakers who started around the same time I started who nobody talks about anymore and they don't work anymore because there was no community. Now, everybody, everybody got a social media team and shit like that. Everybody got, you know, fucking Will, Will Smith does YouTube videos. Like, what does that tell you? Right. You know what I'm saying? Like Kevin Hart did a YouTube fucking show. These guys have millions of dollars and they get exposure in every place, but what they don't get in those other places, community, because it's a very different audience that will sit there on YouTube and they'll fucking tell you exactly how you're doing. An authentic community, people that Very were there, you know, before it was you know cool or whatever necessarily to be up on before YouTube. Before the Will Smiths got yeah, there. Yeah, right. And, and that's a meaningful, deep relationship. And, and one of those, like kind of the meta purposes we see all these things come about is also to bring a lot of this technology mainstream. Yeah. And so with those thousand people that are the diehard in there with everything, it's much more than that, right. obviously with your community. but. Those people have an opportunity then to influence the people within their world, yeah. right? And bring them into the space. So they're huge Kevin Smith fans. And they've been doing that for years. They sell the game, so to speak. In hockey, there's an expression called sell the game. If you love the game, you'll sell the game. Yeah. Which means like, I got no skin in NHL. I got no skin in hockey, but I'll fucking talk about it forever. Yeah. Because maybe, you, maybe you'll watch it. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you already know it, so it's easy to converse about it, but maybe you've never watched it and I'm selling you on it. And I'm selling with passion, not because I'm going to make money off it, but because I believe in it, so I sell the game. Same fucking thing here. When people like what you do, like, you give them a little bit of attention, a little bit of time, they will go off and market your shit for you way better than you ever could to everyone they fucking meet. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, my kid makes fun of me all the time because I wear t-shirts with my face on it, Jay's face on it, like t-shirts of all the shit we've ever done. And she's like, Dad, it's so gross how you wear shirts with your face on it. I was like, kiddo, I can't expect some motherfucker to pay fucking $20 for a shirt with my face on it if I'm not willing to wear that fucking shirt myself. <laughs> right. It starts here. Yeah, we're, yeah. Hey, we're rocking the edge of the Exactly, and, exactly. And, and, and people are like, I love how you guys always stay on brand. It's really important. <laughs> you uh, built a fucking thing. Think about that. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, everyone appreciates somebody who builds a thing. Unless they build, like, a fucking hate machine. But, like, you built a thing and, like, you're proud of it. Yeah, and and so people vibe on that. Cause like that's yours, a thing that didn't exist until you guys were like, we're gonna fucking put this thing together. We're gonna put these three terms together, and it's gonna define our life for the next five, ten, maybe twenty years, perhaps the rest of your fucking lives. Why wouldn't you wear fucking hats with Edge of NFT on it? Right on. Why aren't you completely branded? Where's the shirt and the shorts and the underwear? We're, we're <laughs> and working. the socks. We're, we're, we're working on it. Um, <laughs> we're working so, on it. So, so, guy, a question for you, man, is, um, you know, Kevin's pushing the envelope here. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that forces you guys to push the envelope and, and sort of look at and reflect on what this last year has been for Web3 and some of the ups and downs and challenges, not only within your own project, but just in general in the space. What are you thinking of in terms of innovation and tools and like what sort of um, tweaks are you making um, as you kind of collaborate with Kevin over the next year? Sure. So first of all, a community is always key. I agree with that. In terms of in terms of um, innovation, ups and downs. I'm a veteran in the space, so I don't really pay attention to this. If anything, there's less noise right now, so we're having more fun. Like just in this conference, like if you've been around, there are like between 50 to 100 people from the core secret community. These are not employees. They're not getting paid by us. They just like what we're doing and they're kind of like spreading the word and what can be done. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to me, like that's the first and, and, and most important thing to do. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to innovation, especially with the Kilo um, um, Was Here project and, and, and the Tarantino one and a few others, what we've noticed is there's there's a gap right now. So if we do like an NFT drop that is very, very focused, you know, it has DeFi components, generative R components, maybe speculative components, it's very easy to track the fairly small Web3 crowd that already exists. But I think what we care about is taking this mainstream, right? I think that's what you care about, what I care about, what Kevin cares about. How can this be the next thing? And for that, I, I agree with what Kevin said before, we need to improve the UI. I think 
the user experience right now in crypto is extremely difficult and one of the most I think the, one of the one of the the, the, the the things that prevent the mainstream from crossing the, the chasm, which is the point where we are right now. And so in Secret Network, even though we're often basically an infrastructure company, we've been internally hiring like new engineers that are UI, new UX experts, bringing in other teams from outside to make sure that um, anyone can interact with NFTs, anyone can interact with the project we're doing with Kevin. Um, we, we want to get to a point where people don't even need to know what a digital wallet is. When you go into a website today, it's all HTTPS. You have no idea that there's a handshake encryption protocol going under the hood. You just go into a website. That's the level we need to do, and that's the way to attract like the, the mainstream audience like Kevin's. Well, guys, we could, we could spend all day talking about this stuff and y'all are in high demand, so we do need to, um, to wrap this up. But uh, where can folks go to make sure they're on top of all the fun things happening with Kilroy and with Secret? Uh, Kilroywashere.io for Kilroy stuff. Where are they going for Secret? Yeah, Secret is a secret.network, S-C-R-T.network. That's the best place to get all the information. Also, um, specifically, Kilroy was here is built on LegendDAO, so you should go to LegendDAO.io, and if you go there, by the way, you can join the, the Kilroy was here Discord and community, and there's some surprises for the people who do that. Amazing. Y'all, thanks for sharing all these insights. It's super helpful. Thanks for taking the time. Appreciate Thank you guys you. taking that time as well. All right. Thanks a lot. I want to be there for the LA show, boys. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, yeah, for sure.